um, adding space to your data, but what about time? So it feels like almost these links to previous um, layers you're, you're talking about uh, steps in time, but of course that's not what we're talking about. Um, we're talking about um, multiple layers in the, the network itself. But what if you do have data that goes across time? Um, you could have... Um, A data set where um, the the relation across uh, time as as it's progressing, like sensor data um, or anything where you're collecting a time series um, that is relevant, what happened, you know, in in multiple time steps, right? Um, so if you want your um, your hidden layers of your network to refer to the previous time step and not just um, the current data, then you have to have some kind of link um, to previous states, right? So they call this um, recurrent um, neural networks. Um, so in that notation from the um, deep learning textbook, um, we've got hidden layers, we've got data that's coming in at some time t that's arrived, you have hidden layers for that node, um, but when you had data from a previous time step, it would have its own nodes in a way, um, its own instance of those nodes and be learning some weights, and so how do you link them together? Basically, um, your hidden layer um, in your network has to have a link to um, the values of nodes that were trained on, on previous data somehow. So this link back in time. So in the other um, version of the images, um, you essentially have um, some input data and then some nodes that link back to themselves, which don't really help to understand it either. Um, <laughs> So, as an, as an idea, just having um, a neural network that has links um, basically unfolding across time, weights that you're going to learn for every time step, um, the idea has been around for a while. Um, so that's just a recurrent neural network is the idea that you have that link somehow backwards. Um, but getting it to work is, is the trick, right? Because it actually leads to a lot of problems. So the vanishing gradient problem that we talk about with very deep networks would happen there as well because um, you're still multiplying all these numbers together. Um, in Once you're adding steps relating to previous time, um, it's really tricky to figure out how far back you should go, right? So you might think that it's useful to remember information from far in the past, but then you're going to have the same thing you have with the dense net where you have many arcs coming into every node. And if you're always remembering all the data from the past and your data is going on for years, right, it'll be infeasible. The in, the in graph will be too large. Um, you can't have um, that many weights, right? Um, so you want to just look at some recent portion of the past, um, but how far back should you go? Right? And so if you're looking at text processing, the classic example um, it would be, you know, you're, you're talking about something in context um, and you want to know that these words are related, right? So it's, it's reasonable that somebody says, uh, I grew up in China and I speak fluent Chinese, that these would be something you'd expect, right? If you're trying to do classification or prediction of the next words um, and it's asking you to predict what language they're speaking, the word from one sentence ago might be relevant, but maybe they said this five sentences ago, right? How far back should you remember, right? Um, so that kind of thing, if you're just saying, let's add links to the past, and they're hard-coded, that it always goes back like two seconds into the past, you won't be able to solve that, right? Um, but, so what if you want to remember things from very far back? Um, then people had to um, design um, new approaches for doing this. So. Um, the LSTM, this long-term, short-term network, it's a very oddly named um, thing, I think, but LSTM, it uh, implements RNN. So RNN is really a more general concept of like, let's add links to the past in your network, um, recurrent links. But how you do that, there's got to be different ways to do that, right? Um, so an LSTM does it in this particular way, um, it's going to create long-term dependencies um, between some hidden nodes and keep them. Um, but then it's got some mechanism inside that it's going to train. And the main thing that it focuses on is when can you forget some information and when can you not forget it. Um, like in that case with knowing that the person said I'm from China, 
that's something that's going to be useful because later on you had them talking about their country or their language they were speaking. Um, and so in your training, it was necessary to save it. So they've got a similar idea in a way to what Inception was, that they define a new type of module. And inside this module, rather than just being a single hidden layer with just neurons, it's got something else, right? The Inception had multiple filters and everything. Um, LSTM's got a mechanism in here. So this mechanism um, has a bunch of uh, variables that um, it tunes, right? So it's got um, a 10H is, um, well, and these sigmoids, right? So these, these things here are um, the sigmoid and the 10H um, nonlinearities. Non and you can see what it's doing, right? So XT is the current data coming in uh, for the current time step, and it's got some hidden nodes that are going to learn data from this hidden from this current time step and go forward, right? But it also has links to the previous time step, and every time step before has the same mechanism here with a bunch of weights, right? And so it's got inputs coming from um, the previous step, which kind of are how important to weight it and combine it with the current one. So should I compare previous hidden output features um, to uh, so in previous data um, to the current data? And should I, um, they're both comparing different outputs from, from previous steps, right? So um, this top one basically just filters it through. So keep the data as it was converted um, with a single nonlinearity. So this first sigmoid is like the normal sigmoid or ReLU function, um, and it just moves it forward and it concatenates it, right? So they do the same thing Inception did, where you just take that vector and add it on to the current state. So we'd have our, our current state variable and some of the previous states that we're gonna st store. But on top of that, they also keep the one that is after all this kind of weighting um, that it might learn. Um, and these other weights are basically to tell it when to forget that data. Right, um, and so um, when it uh, all of these the, the weights um, here, I guess the X's here are other weights inside this network that are being learned. Um, you can decide to basically throw away some data because it's no longer being used for any of the the purposes. So you're doing classification, or say you're doing prediction of the next word that word's just never coming up anymore, it'll learn to basically downweight it and get rid of it, right? So it's learning um, on top of learning the normal weights that it has to do for its task, it's learning whether it should forget any previous data along the way. Um, and so we can keep track of certain facts or certain data points that happen because they're still being used um, and backpropagation is just gonna train these as well. So, um, that's a module that people kind of use pretty effectively. Um, people have been trying to come up with simpler versions of it, I think, um, because it's um, its own arbitrary design um, and it has reasonable uh, logic in it, but uh, it's sometimes hard to train, people find. But it does implement this idea, basically, of you can't remember everything, so decide what's important to remember and forget everything else. Um, I have a, this, yeah, there's a couple of ways these are applied, which I'll, I'll mention, but then there's also a, a more recent one that looks to um, actually sound processing the one I was mentioning before, which I'll link to uh, a recent paper that has a different model. Um, so in some ways these are, are used, so LSTM packages, you can kind of look those up and, as a standard thing as well, and they give even more hyperparameters to tune, so it doesn't make the hyperparameter problem any better. Um, but now you could actually get to the other thing um, that was being asked about in a way, is how do you combine multiple different things together? Um, so we used this on a project for um, forest fires for a while. Um, these are called long-term recurrent convolutional neural networks. Um, so they've got time and images um, combined together. So let's imagine the task is um, try to recognize what somebody's doing in a video, right? You're watching a video on YouTube and you want the system to basically annotate and say, what is this person doing? This person is making coffee. This person is eating their breakfast. This person is riding a horse, right? Um, 
so you could come up with a label and say here's the text prediction for it or even just a number and say okay this is an image that is a beach or a home or you know um, the workplace um, whatever your task is you've got some output label for every frame of an of a video say that's the task right you got a video with labels on it you want to predict um, how would you do that right so it is a video so every frame of the video is an image so you want to process the image with a CNN um, and the CNN could be any of the things we've talked about um, it could just be a three layer conf max pool combination um, or it could be a ResNet or whatever um, so it's going to turn that image um, into an RB, RGB, you know, X, Y um, spatial image into a vector of numbers. And you can decide what the output vector size is depending on what you need. Say you pick like 1024 um, as your vector size and you've got a bunch of numbers coming out that describe this image. Um, all of this, these CNNs have weights that are going to be trained by backpropagation, but then the vectors go out to LSTMs and you have um, an LSTM network that tries to learn um, how this image relates to the previous image. So we have an LSTM node, um, like we, we were talking about, so it's going to have links to the past and links to the current data. So this one and the third one is going to look at the output vector for that image at this time step and the previous time step, and it might be remembering arbitrary data points from previous time steps. Right? Um, and what it's going to try and learn is um, pairwise um, like steps, so one image to the next, and then um, try to make that prediction. I don't remember why it has two columns of LSTMs together. It seems like you know you should be able to do it with a single column, but um, there's some reason why that was helpful to them. Maybe to have two steps. I'm not sure why. Um, but the idea then is you have a video as your input now. Um, and you have a model that has enough weights that can remember the past, decide what to forget, look for patterns, and fit these labels. And then this entire thing is trained with backpropagation and you just let the weights figure it out. Um, and this can work. Um, so if you look up the um, LRCN um, papers, um, I should have found that. Um, the videos of like running um, a video and trying to do um, annotation and activity recognition, they call it, um, in a sequence of images and trying to figure out what happens next. Um, what was this? Right, and so even beyond that, then they tried to use this to basically predict the next frames of a video. Um, because if you can learn a model that makes predictions, um, you could essentially do like we were talking before, having an embedding, right? Instead of, um, well, you could train it on your, your predictions. So if you can basically do activity recognition in your video and label what's happening. Once you've trained that, the final layer output here is gonna be a very nice embedding, um, a representation of what's happening in this video, right? You could take the embeddings for individual images or pairs of, of images in sequence, or maybe 10 frames of a video in sequence and take that embedding output. Um, and try to learn that, right? And try to like save it. Um, and so uh, what they do then is use um, this idea of an autoencoder, um, which we haven't explicitly talked about yet, um, that um, you train on your input data and then try to regenerate your output data, right? So if you use um, a model like this and just try to reproduce your input video um, rather than prediction, what you're going to be doing is learning a video that knows what's going to happen next, right? And so they could use this to basically guess and finish a video. So you have these actually taken YouTube like um, video images, and then it'll try to guess what the next frames will be. Um, it drops off pretty quickly in accuracy, obviously, because it's a complex system, but they can kind of visualize what's going to happen the next few frames, um, which is kind of what our brains can do, right? We look at a situation, we kind of predict what's going to happen next, and we could even imagine that we see what happens next. Um, by kind of generating what it looks like. Um, so that's something that um, you could use these for. Um, a more recent, where did I have it? Yeah, so a more recent paper on um, RNNs um, 
literally last year, was talking on this problem of um, speech channel separation. Um, and they are talking about um, dual pass recurrent neural networks. Um, so I haven't looked at this in super detail. Um, I just want to kind of show it as an idea of how we can piece together different things um, that, that we've talked about basically at like infinitely many ways um, to get different models. Um, so in their idea, they have, um, they're looking at sound data, like uh, voice data, and you're trying to separate out a voice from some noise. Um, you have some sequential input, and they're dividing it up into basically a sliding window um, of smaller pieces of input, so maybe a second or a few seconds um, of data. And those become your kind of um, input training set over time. Um, and then uh, they, they have an RNN, so they have a, a by RNN, which means that they have a, a recurrent neural network of some kind that has layer links going forward and backward in time. Um, so this network could also learn from the future to figure out what the previous step should have been, which isn't fair if you're trying to do prediction um, online. But if you're doing a pre-processing thing, why not, right? You want to do forward passes and backward passes and figure out what's the consistent way to represent you know, um, two seconds of audio of this thing, um, because your network is representing every two seconds of audio, um, and you give it a series of inputs, you're training a network that essentially knows about time over this, this window, right? Um, so, but they've chunked up the data into some that format, and then they have some kind of um, RNN that has net links going forward and backward in that, that way, and then they have a fully connected um, network afterwards. So once, just like a CNN produces a bunch of a vector of numbers from your images, um, these RNNs, at some point you just take the outputs as an embedding and you, you can do further fully connected training to do the classification or prediction or whatever you want. Um, that's kind of your general workhorse, right? Doing a fully connected layer. Then they do some kind of normalization to get an output answer. Um, and then I guess they're doing an autoencoder again where they are reproducing their output. Maybe they're just doing it twice. Um, and so um, this lets you, uh, okay, four second segments is what they were doing. 100 epochs of, uh, of four second um, training. Okay, so they have an LSTM in there as well. Um, so every one of their blocks is an LSTM, um, but it's one where the links go forward and backward. Um, and then they have various data about what parameters they chose to train it. Um, this is another way to combine them together to process some of these um, challenging data sets. Let's see if they had anything else. 